Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Petheker, the Physical Secretary and Vice President of the Society. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here to the 2012 International Lecture. Now, before we proceed with this, I've got a few housekeeping details. This is being a webcast podcast, webcast live, so all those nice little technical devices in your pockets which make silly noises at various times of the evening, could I ask you to turn them all off? I won't just say cell phones, you've probably got all kinds of other interesting gadgets in your pocket, but if you could keep them um, switched off or muted or otherwise suppressed so we don't uh, interfere with the talk. And likewise, if you go in for sort of wild cheering or other kinds of excitement during the talk, um, please do it in such a way that our speaker is not sort of um, um, <laughs> over, <laughs> overrun by the sound of the cheering and so forth. OK, so just a few... <laughs> I am a pretty strong boy. OK. <laughs> So, anyway, the Society over, well, as you know, is 351, I think, years old at the moment, and uh, uh, has, over a long period of time, evolved a whole series of lectures, many of them international content. This goes right back to the very early days of the Society, was international connections was, were absolutely vital to understand what was going across, science, going across uh, the world in terms of science. And um, the international lectures have had a variety of forms over the years. Sometimes they've been bilateral arrangements, sometimes they've been ad hoc. And what we have at the moment is essentially a system where each year there's at least one highlight and occasionally two major highlight lectures given by people from abroad covering areas which are of you know, really great significance, hot topics, and of course of global significance in scientific terms. Now it's therefore my pleasure for the 2012 international lecture to welcome, without a great deal of further ado, um, Dr. Rolf Dieter Hoyer, who is the Director General of CERN. And the title of his talk for us this time is The Search for a Deeper Understanding of Our Universe at the Large Hadron Collider, the World's Largest Particle Accelerator. Professor Hoyer. Thank you very much. Now, because it's webcast, I'm strongly advised to stay here. And people who know me know that this is difficult for me because I would like to walk around, but okay, in the UK I obey the orders. <laughs> it would be slightly different at CERN, I can tell you. Okay, the search, the title was just mentioned. So, what is today's, one of today's scientific challenge? It is to understand the very first moments of our universe after the Big Bang. You have here the Big Bang, and the universe was a hot spot, tiny, extremely hot, and since then it has evolved into what is our universe today, roughly 14 billion years, and the size today is 10 to the 28 centimeters. I don't know if any of you can imagine what 10 to the 28 centimeters mean. I cannot. Maybe it helps you if you replace the centimeter by dollars. <laughs> <coughs> you have roughly the square of the American deficit. <laughs> it doesn't help me much, but <laughs> I can tell you I understand now that the American deficit is pretty large. That's all I got from that. Okay, so... But that's on a ruler now, the development of the Big Bang up to today, here essentially from zero to today. And I think it's equally difficult to imagine the large scales as to imagine the small scales. Yeah? From a certain distance onwards, it's essentially zero. It's very difficult to imagine the numbers. Okay, what you can imagine is the human size. And I've put here the young Rutherford. Because to my mind, with the young Rutherford 101 years ago, Nuclear physics and today particle physics really started. Yeah? That was a, with, with Rutherford. So we can today look into the history of our universe either on the right hand side, looking into the sky with either space based telescopes or ground based telescopes, and in that way we look into the history of the universe. The problem is that once you look with light, you get only as close as roughly 300,000, 400,000 years to the Big Bang. This is already pretty close compared to, 10 to, uh, compared to uh, 14 billion years, but you don't get closer, yeah? because there's no information carried out of the universe with light below 300,000 year, years roughly. 
And now comes, I changed my mind. Now comes the word neutrino, David. Okay. With neutrinos, you get as close as one second, roughly, to the, uh, to the Big Bang. So much, much closer, because they get, got out of this hot matter much earlier than the photons. However, we beat everything. When you go to the left-hand side, to the small distances, yeah? much smaller than the proton diameter. The proton is the, uh, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. Much smaller than that one. For that one, for, if you go so, so small, you need a very high resolution power. And the higher your resolution power, unfortunately, the more energy you need. So you need a lot of energy in order to resolve the small distances. And the Large Hadron Collider is nothing else than a super microscope getting as close as one millionth of a millionth of a second to the Big Bang. So this is much, much closer than anything else can get. Okay. And with these super microscopes, the predecessors of the Large Hadron Collider and the Large Hadron Collider, we started 101 years ago to find out that we are essentially empty. Yeah? I mean, Rutherford found out that everybody of you is essentially empty. Yeah? Okay, you don't believe it, but it is like that. That the atoms consist out of the nuclei and the electron clouds around it. Today we know that the nuclei consist out of the protons and the neutrons, and these in turn consist out of the quarks and the gluons, and the quarks of the, and the gluons are the today's atomos. That means they can no longer be separated, uh, uh, divided into smaller parts. So these are the smallest particles we know of today. And the nice thing is, if we study the physics laws of the first moments after the Big Bang, we have a fantastic symbiosis between particle physics on the one hand side astrophysics on the other hand, and cosmology. And these are the topics which really bring also young people into science. And I think everybody, every country needs scientists and engineers. Yeah? And these are the topics with such flagships, you get them attracted. You get them fascinated, and they, they start in, in school with, with, with math and physics, and also then afterwards in the universities. So let's see what have we learned here about the smallest particles, about the constituents of matter. And it took us roughly 50 years to learn about the standard model, and this is the st status of the standard model. The physical world is composed out of quarks and leptons. And these are three families of quarks and leptons. Two quarks in each family, two leptons in each family. And all of you, everything here consists only out of the first family the up and the down quark, which makes the protons and the neutrons, and therefore the, the atomic nuclei, and the leptons, the electron, which neutralizes the, uh, the nuclei so that you have the atoms. For us all, this first family is enough. Nature has decided to take another family here, essentially all the same properties as in the first family, except that each particle in the second family is heavier than, heavier than the counterpart in the first family. That's the only difference. And then nature has decided to take a third family, even heavier. The top quark here is the heaviest known elementary particle, point-like particle. It is as heavy as a gold atom. Point-like particle, as heavy as a gold atom. It's, again, difficult to imagine. So this is the periodic system of the microcosm. Only four times three entries. That's much easier, easier than chemistry. Huh? <laughs> Particle physics is much easier than chemistry. Sometimes. <laughs> now these quarks and leptons, the fermions, they interact via force carriers. Carriers, they are the gauge bosons. These force carriers, the photon for the electromagnetic force, the gluons for the strong force, the Z and W for the weak force. And the last entries into that matrix were 1995 and 2000 was the top quark and the tau neutrino. And that's all what we need to describe our world. And we have tested, and this is now, it looks more complicated than it is. We have tested this standard model at the level of quantum fluctuations. What are quantum fluctuations? Well, according to Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, 
you can produce virtual very heavy particles without seeing them, but you see the effect of these particles. And this is here. Without these uh, virtual particles, you have this diagram. With the virtual particle, you have, the, for example, the top quark loop in here, or Higgs and Z. These are virtual particles which pop up very, very shortly according to Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. And at LEP, the large electron positron ring at, in Geneva, the predecessor of the LHC, we could indirectly determine the top, the mass of the top quark through such loop corrections. Because we could not find the top because the top is much heavier than the energy of, the, of, of LEP could deliver. So the top quark, we could not produce it directly. So we could only see it indirectly. And you see here the allowed mass range of the mass of the, the allowed range of the mass of the top quark as a function of the year of the data analysis. And you see at the beginning, uh, 20 years ago, it was a huge range allowed. And then 10 years later, it narrowed down to roughly 175 plus or minus few GeV indirect measurement. And the same value was found at Tevatron, where the energy that was a, an accelerator in the, UK, uh, in the United States, uh, in Fermilab at uh, close to Chicago. And the top quark was discovered with a mass of 175 GeV. So this is a fantastic internal consistency check of the standard model because the indirect measurement and the direct measurement coincided. That means you know these corrections. You know these tiny corrections here. And you know them because our theorists can calculate these corrections and we can do precise measurements. This is a fantastic cross-check. And the same once you have then the top mass, once you have it also determined directly, then you can look, is there anything missing in the standard model? And that's the Higgs, the Higgs mass, the Higgs boson mass. And that was 1996, the allowed mass range for the Higgs boson, very large, from 50 to 600 GeV. Today, we are between 100 and in 2005, today we are much closer, much smaller. Um, 2005, we were between 100 and 200 GeV. And this is, again, because we could, they could calculate these corrections and we could measure very precisely. And you see the Higgs mass enters with its logarithm into the equations, the top work with its square. That means any change in the top work mass makes a big change in the, in the Higgs mass influence. And you see here, in this year, there was a, devi a different mean value of the, of the top work mass, and this immediately made a change in the prediction for the Higgs. But it shows you that, again, you can precisely predict where, if the Higgs boson exists, where the Higgs boson should, should lie. And that was the basis in 2005. And this should indicate to you what is, what is the status of the tests of the standard model. There are 17 quantities at zero. If, if the value is at zero, that means it coincides exactly with what the standard model would predict to you. If it's at one, two, or three, it deviates by, with one, two, or three standard deviations. Now, you expect when you measure many, many quantities to have many one standard deviations, a few two standard deviations, and even sometimes a few three standard deviations distance to the value. And you see there's one three standard deviation value. And actually, this is fantastic that you need it because with this without this point, the fit would be too good. You need that fit, yeah? And that's always my message to the theorists. Don't get too excited about the three sigma effect. Yeah? You need five sigmas in order to be more or less sure that something new is happening. OK, so this is fantastic. So that the model has been tested with per mil accuracy, or below per mil, sub per mil. The problem is there's one cornerstone missing within the standard model, and this is what is the origin of mass of ele elementary particles? Now, instead, you, you can define the mass as a property of particles with the same energy E to move with a certain velocity. And that's the only equation I have in my talk. So the velocity depends on the mass at the same energy. The heavier the mass, the smaller, the lower the velocity. That means mass zero, you go with the velocity of, the, of light. Okay? And even now the second time, and even the neutrinos obey this now. Some, 
Well, they do it since we have introduced a radar trap uh, uh, between <laughs> Switzerland and Italy. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the higher the mass, the lower the velocity with the same energy. So that you can do through introduction of a scalar field. That means as a field which is everywhere the same. It yeah, has no special direction. The proud angular Higgs field and particles acquire the mass through the interaction with this field. And the self-interaction of this field is the famous Higgs boson, the Higgs particle. So how can I imagine that? Well, suppose this is a cocktail party of journalists once the cold buffet is finished, because otherwise they would all be on one side, like the physicists. And then I go in there on the left-hand side to that door, and I want to go through here. I would go through massless. Nobody knows me. I have no interaction with this field. I go through massless. Somebody else comes in who is maybe a bit known to the journalists. They crowd around him, and he acquires mass. Yeah? And the more known that person is to the journalist, the more journalists are clustering around that person, that means the heavier that person. OK, so that's the interaction between the person and the field. That's a Higgs mechanism, or BEH mechanism. Now, how can I imagine now uh, the self-interaction? Well, suppose Hoyer opens the door and whispers a rumor into the room. Journalists are very curious. What did he say? OK, that's the self-interaction of the field. That's a Higgs boson. That's particle physics. Yeah. <laughs> Again, you don't need any equation. That's all. Yeah. It can be very beautiful and so easy. OK, so that's a Higgs mechanism. The point is, the Higgs particle is the last missing cornerstone of the standard model. And we know everything about this particle, all its properties. The only thing we don't know is if it exists at all. But wait until the end of the talk, OK? OK, fine. But there are other key questions of particle physics open. Can we unify the forces, electroweak, strong, and uh, uh, electromagnetic strong and weak force? We cannot, within the standard model, at the high energy, we cannot. These are the dashed curves. However, with the introduction, for example, of supersymmetry, another theory around the uh, standard model, we could. Is there a fundamental symmetry of forces and matter? We don't know. In how many space dimensions do we live? Are we really living only in three space dimensions? I don't know. And the tiny question, what is dark matter, what is dark energy? Because the standard model only describes around 4 to 5% of the visible universe. 95% of are invisible. It's a dark universe. One quarter is dark matter. Three quarters is dark energy. Dark matter clumps like normal matter, and dark energy drives the universe apart in all directions in an accelerated way. And I think it was last year that it was the Nobel Prize, wasn't it? It was last year, yeah. The Nobel Prize for the accelerated expansion of the universe, not for dark energy, but for the expanded uh, acceleration of the universe. We know very little about dark matter. We know uh, even less about dark energy, so we... It took us 50 years to describe roughly 5% of the universe. It's, it's amazing. Yeah? We have a lot of work in front of us. So what could be solutions? Now, is the standard model successful forever? And you see, these are all Nobel Prize winners, which had something to do with the standard model, except of one, the one in color here. Peter Hicks doesn't have it yet. So what could be the solutions? Could it be a new supersymmetry, extra dimensions, more than three dimensions, grand unified theories, technicolor, or whatever new theory? But there's one thing in common with every, every of these theories, that for all the proposed solutions, new particles should appear at the TV scale or below, and that's the territory of the LHC. And this is why we are all so excited about running the LHC. That brings me to the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. In a beautiful setting, sometimes, when the, air is, when the air is clear. The LHC has nothing of it because it's uh, out of this nice view, because it's 100 meters below ground. 
It's the largest, or one of the largest scientific instruments ever built, 27 kilometers of circumference. More than 10,000 people involved in design, construction, and now running it, and then exploiting, not running, exploiting it. And it collides protons to pro reproduce conditions at the birth of the, or close to the birth of the universe, 40 million times a second. And you see, 100 meters below ground, there's one vacuum tube where the packets of protons run anti-clockwise and one, one uh, tube where they run clockwise and we get them to collisions at several points. And this is how it looks in reality and this is the way I like it because then everything is closed and we can take data. <clears throat> the LHC is one of the coldest places in the universe because we run the 27 kilometers, the, the magnets, at a temperature of minus 271 Celsius, or 1.9 Kelvin above absolute zero. Outer space is at 2.7. So it's the largest refrigerator on Earth. At the same time, it's one of the hottest places in the galaxy. Because the collisions of two proton beams generates temperature much higher than those in the center of, sun, of the sun. Now, if you collide the two protons, it's like colliding a mosquito and a mosquito in full fly. With two mosquitoes colliding in full fly, I don't think you get anywhere close to the Big Bang. What, what is the, the point is, it's the energy density. It's the energy of the protons divided by the area of the protons. And the proton is 10 to the minus 18 centimeters, I think. 15. Hmm? Ah, numbers. <laughs> 10 to the minus large. <laughs> and this gives you a huge energy density. Yeah? And this is how you get to one millionth of a millionth of a second close to the Big Bang. So here again, the design energy is 7 plus 7 TeV, 14 TeV. In its full running in its 2,800 and 2,800 uh, packets. So they are separated by seven and a half meters. So every 25 nanoseconds, we have a collision, so 40 megahertz crossing rate. We have 10 to the 11 protons per bunch. This gives this number of luminosity, what, so the, which is a measure for the number of collision per second. And this gives you, per crossing of, a, of two packets, gives you around, on average, 35 proton-proton interactions per packet crossing. This is huge. Yeah? So 10 to the 9 proton-proton interactions per second. So in each collision, you produce 1,000 charged particles. Today, we are running a bit, little bit lower. Our energy is 4 plus 4. That's 8 TeV. We run only with half the number of packets. So we have only 20 megahertz crossing rate. However, we have a luminosity, a number of collisions per second already very close to the final value. Now, since this value scales with energy, that means we are already now, today, beyond our design in crossing rate. After two and a half years of running. This is fantastic. So that means we have around this number of interactions per crossing, which is, of course, an enormous challenge for the detectors, for the data collection, for the data storage, and the analysis. Okay, so 2010, we entered a new era, in, or end of 2009, we entered a new era in fundamental science. We explore now a new energy frontier with proton and heavy ion collisions. And we have four experiments, four big experiments, and three small experiments around the ring. And in each of these experiments, we get, we get the the uh, packets to cross each other and to interact with each other. Why four experiments? Well, they are complementary. We have two general purpose ex detectors, and if you look here on the larger one, Atlas, this is the size of an average technician. Okay, not everybody got that. So it's 20 times 20 times 40 cubic meters, and in the whole volume, we measure the trajectories of the particles which are produced at the interaction roughly with, the diameter, with an accuracy of the diameter of the human hair over in the whole volume. We have a specialized detector to study heavy quarks. This studies essentially the question why we are at all here. 
Because at the beginning of the universe, at the, at the Big Bang, matter and antimatter were produced in equal quantities. Now matter and antimatter annihilate, so we would not be here. Everything would be gone. However, nature has introduced a small asymmetry between matter and antimatter, one part in 10 billion. And this one part in 10 billion is sitting here, is sleeping here, and is watching me. <laughs> okay, this is this, this, that's this small asymmetry. We know quite a lot about this asymmetry, but we are still missing a lot of, of questions to solve to understand it. Then we have a specialized detector to study the heavy ion collisions. And there is overlap in physics reach between the top three, because a key feature is to identify these heavy quarks, which could be a key to understand the difference between matter and antimatter. That means you have to measure the traveling distance of these heavy quarks, which you can do, for example, in LHCP, but also in the omnipurpose experiments, ATLAS and CMS. And there's overlap between the, the bottom three, and the key feature here is to reconstruct more than 20,000 charge tracks, more than 20,000 trajectories inside these detectors. Imagine there are 10,000 tracks in here, which you all measure. And from this measurement, like in a digital camera, you look at the picture and you reconstruct what you took, yeah? so like, like in a photo. This is fantastic. I would never have imagined that a detector like Alice can resolve 10,000 tracks. So, in a nutshell, the versatility of LHC and its complementarities of the experiments make the whole of LHC a more powerful instrument than the sum of its parts. And this is, again, ATLAS, uh, one of the largest and most complex detectors. And wouldn't you agree with me that this is also art? No? Oh, this is, okay. So what's that? <laughs> Okay, I mean, it's very similar, isn't it? <laughs> Even these red uh, stripes, etc., the eight-fold symmetry, everything. This is the state design of the uh, opera of Hector Bellios. That means artists are also getting inspired from our science, from our instruments. And this is why we have introduced and started this year a new program that we don't collide only particles, we also collide artists <laughs> and scientists. And we have already the second artist in residence now. And the artists gave very nice uh, introductory lectures, and the house was full. It's fantastic, yeah? And I really hope that something gets out very positively out of these collisions. Okay, we will see. Okay, back to physics. Um, the basic process is at LHC. You, you collide the two protons. Now, protons are composite particles out of quarks and gluons. And you never know which quark or which gluon of each of this proton collides with, with this one. Now, for example, if two quarks collide and then, again, two quarks get out, you get two jets of particles, jets of energy. And if you roll out the detectors, you see very nicely here two clearly peaked jets of energy. So this is a basic process at the LHC. But this is not what you are looking at for new physics. For new physics, you look at much rarer processes, like this one, where two, glu where two gluons, for example, fuse, and then the Higgs could, for example, uh, be produced, and that would decay then in a clear signature, like here, in two sets in this case. The problem is that the production rate of the various processes is very, very different. There are more than 10 orders of magnitude difference between the total reaction rate and the standard model physics and the new physics down here. That means we have to select one out of much more than 10 billion interactions in order to find at least a hint, one hint of new physics. So that means you need a lot of collisions, and we measure the collisions in the measures of integrated luminosity, and we had promised for 2011 from the management a number one inverse femtobahn. We delivered a factor of 5.5 more. Now you can say, if you put your promises very low, then of course you can exceed it very well. Okay, fine. I think that might be the trick of the man. Okay. Um, the point was that when we promised that, we didn't have much experience with the running of the machine. And we only got more and more experience later. And therefore, it was no wonder that we could very well exceed that. But 
nonetheless, the machine surprised us very much with, with its fantastic running, and the experiments were also very well doing. Now, in order to reach such a high integrated number of collisions, you have to have also a high number of collisions per second, per, per unit time. That means here you have, for example, inside one package, 20 collisions. You see, and all of these 20 collisions are very well measured. This is the beam pipe. And you have here a collision, here a collision, here one, etc., etc. And there are the two yellow tracks, trajectories coming out. You see them here. So you can identify which trajectory came from which vertex. So the detectors are working very well. They record data of high quality with high efficiency at a rate not expected at such an early stage. That one really has to say after two years. Now, what are the physics objectives? Well, this is the physics. It's a, number, a function of time. And this is the integrated luminosity. You start very low with very few collisions. And we are here today. At last year, we were at 5. Today, we are at 8.5. So we have already accumulated much more. So we are now here. And you start with the basic physics. You go deeper and deeper and lower and lower in cross-section. And you rediscover the standard model. Yeah? until you end up here where the new physics might be. So I don't get you through all of this, of course. I just show you two examples, because there are also experts in here, and I cannot give this talk without showing also something to the experts. I give you something about the W and Z and the top. This is W and Z physics. So you see, that's the, cross, the production rate of Ws as a function of the energy and LHC is at the moment here. And you see that all the points, from, from the, in this case, from the ATLAS experiment, lie exactly on the curve which the standard model expects. So you have reproduced the production rate of the Ws, which, is, which are one of our standard candles. You have re reproduced this product, re production rate at a high energy. So you understand, at least in that part, the standard model. Then you check out does the Z and the W behave as the standard model expect? Namely, is this quantity here and this quantity at 1? This is a measurement. This is where the standard model sits. Hot, st spot on the standard model. No deviation. Then you go to the top mass. The, as I told you, the heaviest elementary particle we know of. And this is a measurement of the mass of the top. And you see... 20 years of Tevadron are now overtaken by two years of LHC. So the LHC combination or the, the experiment co combination is nearly as good as a combination of Tevadron two years into the game after 20 years here. Fantastic. This is really, I would never have expected that such a result already two years into the running of this machine. And this is a summary of the main measurements of the standard model, starting with a high cross-section, the high probability for producing something, going five orders of magnitude down to the well-known processes here. Everything is measured very well. These are the, the, the points. And the theory are these orange bars. And there's an excellent, maybe an even too good agreement between the theory and the measurements. It's fantastic, again. So, and today... Only this experiment, ATLAS, has roughly a factor 2 up to factor 10 more of these standard candle measurements than the total of the data set of the two, of the two, firm, uh, of the two Tevatron experiments. This is the advantage of a modern machine with higher energy. We also made discoveries, or some of the detectors, some of the experiments, like the CMS experiment. They discovered a new particle here. And this new particle is a particle which is predicted by the standard model but was not yet seen before. Okay, so here they see it. And why do I show it? Because for an experimentalist like me, it's fantastic to see. This particle decays in a chain here. You see, it, it starts here. This is this new particle. Then it decays first in two particles. Then afterwards it's three, five, six particles. And they reconstruct it. They are able to reconstruct it, and you see it here as a peak. So it's a fantastic cascade, and the whole tracker handles it beautifully. Jim, I must say, this is a good tracker. It's really a good thing. 
Okay, so much the direct measurements. And now to get people awake again, we look at the indirect measurements. Yeah? Because you can also do indirect measurements. And this penguin is there because it's called a penguin diagram here. Okay? What can you look there? You can look, do I see a difference between particle and antiparticle? So here you have the particle, the B0, and here the antiparticle, the anti-B0, both going into a kaon and to a pion, decaying into these. And you see, with the same normalization, by I in the red, this is the particle decay, and this is the antiparticle decay. So the particle decays more often into these two than the antiparticle. Now look, there is a shoulder down here, blue. If you zoom into this shoulder, then you have the B sub S, the B particle which contains a strange quark, also deca decaying into pi and k. And you see here in green, in this case, the particle decays more often into these two compared to the uh, less often compared to the antiparticle. Okay? By eye, you can see immediately what's going on. Unfortunately, this is again standard model. However, before you declare new physics, you have to prove that you understand and reprodu reproduce the standard model. Okay? Now, is there anything new? Well, we can look into the B sub S, again, the B, which contains a strange rock, not going into pi k, but in decaying into two muons. Now, this, two, this decay is very sensitive to new physics. Any deviation from the standard model, which you can calculate very, very precisely, would indicate new physics. And you see, the star here is the standard model. And now, LHCb, the experiment which is dedicated to look for a difference between matter and antimatter, is coming very, very close with its measurement to the standard model. So this window was open before, and now this window is only here, open now. So the new experimental bounds already exclude large parts of the constrained models beyond, new physics, uh, beyond the standard model. So even with the indirect measurement, you can now already constrain very much the phase space for new physics. But we have also something new, because it's not only the heavy quark, the, the, the beauty quark, but also the charm quark. And the beauty of the charm is that it's, it's produced much more often than the, the B quark. And here they see for the first time possibly new physics beyond the standard model. They measure again an asymmetry between particle and antiparticle. And you see this asymmetry is a three sigma asymmetry. It's still three sigma. At the beginning, I said, don't trust three sigma values. But it's an indication. But CDF, from the, the experiment from the Tevatron, confirms this result, also with roughly three sigma. Together, they are nearly four sigma. So this is the first time that they have some evidence of asymmetry, large asymmetry in the charm sector. So this could be physics beyond the standard model. OK. So this is something which gets people quite excited. So we had an excellent performance in 2010 and 2011. More than five inverse femtobahn delivered. It was really the rediscovery of the standard model. And this shows on one transparency all our standard candles, how they were remeasured at 7 and 8 TV now. Fantastic. It is, again, a fantastic plot, very quickly put together by the experiments. So they have a, the experiments have completed their journey through the standard model, and they have started to take us into new territories. So what is a new territory? Well, we still have Newton's unfinished business, but Newton is in inverted commas, so okay. What is mass? We don't know yet. Why is there no more antimatter? What was matter like within the first moments of the Big Bang, of the universe life, sorry? And what, this little embarrassment, what is 96% of the universe made of? Look, 40 years, 50 years to understand 4%, to explain 40%, to describe 40%. Okay. So I hope that you are now, together with me, ready to enter the dark universe. Let's first look at dark matter. Now, it's clear that astronomy and astrophysics will tell us how dark matter with 25% compared to visible matter of 5% or even less, how this has shaped stars and galaxies. But only at particle accelerators you can produce dark matter in quantities 
and understand exactly what it is. Is it composed of a single kind of particle? Or is it more rich, more varied as a visible world? We don't know. But LHC may be the perfect machine to study dark matter. So what is a candidate for dark matter? Well, that's supersymmetry. Supersymmetry has several advantages. It unifies matter with forces. So for each particle, a supersymmetric partner of opposite statistics is introduced. So you double the number of particles. Usually I get then the reply from the auditorium, if the physicists don't know what to do, they double the number of particles. <laughs> they increase the number of, uh, of free parameters and can explain everything. But when Dirac, I don't know, 85, 83 years ago, introduced antimatter, he, with one equation, he doubled the number of particles, matter and antimatter. And imagine what we have learned from that. And today, we use it in hospitals, in PET, the PET scan, positron emission tomography. The P, the positron, is the antiparticle to the electron. He would never have thought about that. It, but it took 40 years to do it. Yeah? I'm not saying that if we, did, if we find supersymmetry that we would use it in 40 years in the hospital. But it shows you that you never know where and when you can use it. OK, it allows to unify uh, the forces. And it provides a dark matter candidate because the lightest supersymmetric particle might be stable. And if it's stable, it has nothing, well, because it has no partner to decay into. And once it's stable, it could be the dark matter. OK, so we have here the standard model. And then we have the supersymmetry, which is for each particle, you have a, a super partner, also for the Higgs. And you could produce at the LHC, for example, two supersymmetric particles decaying into a decay chain into normal particles plus a lower mass supersymmetric, another normal particle, etc., until you reach the lowest mass supersymmetric particle, which, does, which doesn't have a partner and escapes the detector. Okay, so what you have to, to, to measure, you have to measure missing energy, missing momentum. This could be a signal of supersymmetry. Don't get afraid. Supersymmetry is a huge, has a huge parameter uh, space, many, many models. And these are just the different models where you can measure supersymmetric particles. And you see, we are now, for some of the partners, already at 1 TeV, one TeV mass. But OK, there are also, of course, some of the models where you have only 100 GeV, or even less mass measurement. So it really depends on the models. So only within the constraint models, we have crossed the border of roughly 1 TeV mass range. The air is getting thin for the constraint models. But since we have many more models which are not constrained, there's a lot of supersymmetric parameter space open. OK? So one should not get worried. The potential for discovery of supersymmetric particles is sizable even at 7 or 8 TeV. Nonetheless, it's getting difficult for theorists. Because the LHC and LHCB together are attacking their theories. So, OK, some of the theorists have to think of other theories. So the LHC result should allow, together with dedicated dark matter searches, first discoveries in the, in the dark universe. However, still, 73% of the universe is this mysterious dark energy. It's evenly spread. The challenge is to get first hints about the world of dark energy in the laboratory. But here you have to remember the Higgs particle, the Higgs field, is also a scalar because it has to be the same everywhere. I'm not saying, and this is my clear disclaimer, I'm not saying that Higgs and dark energy is the same. However, both are scalars because the Higgs is neither a matter particle nor a force particle. It's a spin zero. It's a scalar. So the Higgs is neither matter nor force. It's just different. And this is the main point here. The Higgs boson would be the first fundamental scalar ever discovered. We have never seen a fundamental scalar up to now. And the Higgs field is thought to fill the entire universe. And it could maybe give some handle to dark energy, which is also a scalar field. OK, so LHC can search for the, for the, and study new scalars with precision. And if we find the Higgs boson, it would be the first fundamental scalar we could measure its properties, and maybe that gives us some idea how fundamental scalars behave. This is the exciting part. So unfortunately, the search for the Higgs boson is not so easy. You see, 
This is again the total production rate and the Higgs boson production rate is much lower here and it depends on its mass. So this is for 150 GeV mass, this is for 500 GeV mass. It also depends on the energy of the machine. This is why higher the energy is more advantageous. It, in addition, it can appear in completely different signatures, images in the detector, again depending on its mass. You see it has a lot of decay possibilities as a function of its mass. So you are dealing with low cross-section and many different possibilities to show up in the detector. So, and this makes it so difficult. And this gives you, should, should just give you a glimpse of what's going on. Only look at the red point, the red uh, squares. This would be signals from the Higgs in, diff in different decay possibilities, in different signatures. And you see the background is usually much higher everywhere, much higher than the red, which would be the signal of the Higgs. So that shows you it's A, difficult, B, low production, and C, a lot of background. So you're dealing with small numbers. And when you're dealing with small numbers, pay attention of statistics. So one has to be very careful before one is stating, claiming I have a discovery. So that should just give you a visual impression how difficult it is to find such a signal. However, the signal would be fantastic. Yeah. This is a, could be a Higgs decaying into two photons. The two photons would, would show up as large energy deposits in the, in, the, uh, in the detector. And here are the other tracks. Fantastic signature, very well to, to identify. However, we have many background processes which could look similar to that. So again, it's a question of statistics. And this is where they are now. That's one of the two experiments, CMS. And here you only have to look. This is a Higgs on the, on the, the red line. Whatever is below the red line, if you, then you have excluded the Higgs boson mass, which is plot, uh, the Higgs boson mass of this value from here to here, because only once you are above the line, you have an indication that you could see something. OK, all this is excluded. Now we zoom into the, uh, into the uh, low mass part. And you see here, around 125, there is something. And that's actually a new analysis for this uh, winter's conference. The published one looks, looks still much wider. So the new one is much sharper. Still, it's only two and a half to three sigma. Again, be careful. But this is the part which is left over. So it took 30 years to experimentally restrict the mass to be above 114 GeV. The two experiments, CMS and Atlas, have now eliminated another 475 GeV of the range in only one year. And that's the limit from CMS, 127.5. The same plot from Atlas, you see again, everything below the line of one is excluded for the standard model Higgs. Zoom in here, and you see again a very similar behavior here in Atlas. And you see what they have improved within one year. They have closed the windows and nearly completely, except of this small window here. And this is the lower limit from Atlas. Also, the experiments at the Tevatron see enhancement in this mass region in another decay mode. So the status of today is the standard model Higgs boson is excluded with 95% confidence level up to 600 GV, except for this window. And there are interesting fluctuations in both experiments around the masses, 124 226 GV. And my prediction is, and I stuck out my neck already last year, with a 2012 run, we expect three times more statistics than last year, that the standard model Higgs boson, the Shakespeare question for the standard model Higgs boson will be answered this year, to be or not to be. End of this year. There's no pressure on the experiments, of course. <laughs> OK. So. But the key message is, for the LHC and the standard model, to find the Higgs is clearly a discovery. To exclude the standard model Higgs is also a discovery, because if we exclude it, we have for the first time a real hole in the standard model. And then we have to find something else to fill it. It would be a huge discovery. Both would be a huge discovery. This is why I can predict this year we will make a discovery at the LHC. <laughs> well, it's true. Because the LHC is not poised to discover the Higgs, it's poised to clarify the mechanism by which elementary particles acquire their mass. Yeah? So either through the Higgs mechanism or something else. Okay, 
So, LHC results will allow to study the Higgs mechanism, if it's there, in detail, and to reveal the character of the Higgs boson. And this would be the first investigation of a scalar field. Yeah? Keep that in mind. Could be the very first step to understanding dark energy. And that's a predictable time uh, line for the LHC. We are running this year at ATV. We'll make this discovery. Then in the year 2013, 14, we shut down the LHC to prepare it to run it at, to run at 14 TV at design energy and nominal luminosity. Ramp up in 2018, we have another, another shutdown to again improve the luminosity. Ramp up the accumulated data in, 22, in 2022. We want to make a jump in the integrated luminosity, so factor three to five more per year and then collect data until we reach roughly 3,000 inverse femtobahn. Today we have eight and a half until roughly the year 2030. So we have a clear program of 20 years for the LHC in which we will, first of all, study either the properties of the Higgs or other mechanisms which would give mass to elementary particles. And, of course, with a higher energy, look for physics beyond the standard model. Okay, so the past decade saw precision studies of nearly 5% of our universe, and I call it the discovery of the standard model. The LHC delivers data in a fantastic way. We are just at the beginning of exploring 95% of our universe. Yeah? And I think the future is bright in the dark universe. Thank you. <laughs>
No. But well, I would I would suggest you are. You're looking for new and new uh, 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 particles, new. Um, uh, well, all the things you've been showing us, but um, it would seem to me that if you really are getting to the fundamental, the most fundamental description of the universe, it should be simpler. Uh, there should be a simpler model behind the one which you have been showing. Because it's one system. Yeah, but I Thank want you. to contradict you. We are not looking for more and more particles. We are looking for what's going on. It could be more particles. It could be something else. We are completely open. Yeah? It's just that one of the possibilities is more particles because there is something out there, which is this dark matter. And we have to, 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 find, to find what it is. It could be the easiest uh, uh, explanation is, is, new, is, other, is new particles. But it's not that we are only looking for new particles. We are looking for new effects. Yeah? Mm. And I, and I agree with you, everything should be simple, because otherwise I don't understand it either. <laughs> uh, I yeah. might point out that you're pay, placing an awful lot of uh, um, emphasis or trust on the astrophysics and the model of the uh, universe, the Big Bang, which is itself only a model. Oh. Yeah, but we have, the, we have the measurements of the astrophysicists. Why should we not trust them if their measurements are correct and the measurements look correct? Yeah. Experimental data. And there are experimental data. Um, if, it's, if it would only be a theory, I would be hesitant. Not that I mistrust the theorists, but every theorist has a, has a different theory. So what is really counting is the experimental evidence, and that we have. Okay, he Thank doesn't you. believe it, but it doesn't matter. Well, that's, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> there's always experiments, as we've just yes. seen. Other questions? <clears throat> One more here. Perhaps I missed it, but I don't think I heard the word gravity used in your yes. lecture. I, I, I might have missed it. Um, no, 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 you were not sleeping. It's okay, it's correct. Yes. Um, um, I left it, it out because, well, I, yeah, because I, usually I use it once when I say that it's gravity through gravitational forces that the uh, that dark matter clumps. But gravity is a factor 10 to the 40 uh, smaller and uh, lower in force compared to the strong force. So we cannot accommodate it at the moment in our theories because we cannot uh, take the field, uh, quantum theory and relativity together yet. Fortunately, we can ignore it in the particle physics world because Do it's much too, 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 too low value. Do you have hopes that the collider may one day um, bring about this uh, marriage of all the four forces? Well, if we would find supersymmetry, that would give at least some boost for quite a few superstring theories, which is the first way to unite these two. Yes. Thank you. But that's all we could do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I see one more down there, at the back. Thank you. I believe that one of the uh, objectives of Alice is to look for hidden dimensions. Is that right? And certainly one of the experiments was, was looking for the disappearance of a particle and then its, re its reappearance a very short time later, which would have meant that it would have circled in a, in a different dimension. I, th I thought that was one of the objectives of Alice. I'm a bit surprised. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if, if you mean, for example, the suppression of one of the type of particles because it interacts in the hot, dense matter. Yeah. If you mean that, but this has nothing to do with hidden dimension. This is pure quantum chromodynamics. This is strong interaction. So none of the CERN, uh, none of the LHC experiments are focusing on the possibility of hidden dimensions. I didn't say that. Ah. I only asked you well, answered what, your question on Alice. That's what I'd like to draw you on, Professor. Okay. Atlas and CMS are, of course, looking for hidden dimensions. Yes. And they have already limits on the size of these hidden dimensions. 
and the higher we go in energy, the better these limits will become. They are looking for it, yes, but not Alice. This was a different story. Okay. I think I don't see any further questions. I think it's an opportune moment. Was there, oh, there one more? Two. I didn't, ah, down there. Sorry, I'm standing close to the edge. I hope I didn't. <laughs> Thank you for a very brilliant lecture. My question is, is there a relationship between the fundamental particles of the standard model you have shown, I think, how many are there, 16 and 1632, and to those of... Uh, String theory model. Oh, yeah, because string theories have to accommodate the, the standard model particles, of course. That, however, they don't consider them as point-like particles. They consider these particles as sort of different, what is it called, not vibra vibrations, mm. uh, or different modes of a string. Again, for me, very difficult to imagine a nearly point-like particle as a string with, with the, vibrating in different modes. But there is a connection, of course, because they have to <coughs> accommodate, of course, the uh, standard model particles, yes. Thank you. We have time for one, one more question we have time for. Thank you. I was very intrigued by your last slide showing your plans up to 2030. I wonder what confidence you have that they're not going to be disrupted by either political or financial considerations in Europe over that long period. That's a pretty good question. But if you don't show a vision, if you don't show a program, then you are definitely disrupted. <laughs> so you have to show a vision, you have to show a program, and you have to have milestones on which you deliver. And then I'm confident. Well, that gives an excellent moment for me to sum up uh, your talk. And first of all, thank you for the exploration of the frontiers. This really is exploration in its true sense, um, in the very best tradition of all the explorations that have gone on in science in many centuries. It's also remarkable what an extraordinary experimental and engineering achievement this is, which is quite an incredible achievement. And of course, as you pointed out, it's also as a result an art form, which I think is a very valuable contribution. Perhaps we should remember this being the international lecture, that of course, it's also dependent on a huge amount of international collaboration. In a project like this, it's the common which across the nations that the scientific enterprise represents that is really celebrated in some way by the lecture today. So I'd like you to ask me to join thanking Professor Hoyer for his fantastic lecture, the Director General of CRN. Thank you for coming here and speaking to us. Thank you very much. Right.